Hi, I'm Hannah Gurman, Manager of Digital Experience here at Marketing Science Institute. MSI helps marketers become better marketers. Our business and academic thought leaders collaborate to create new marketing knowledge which we share in a variety of ways. One of the most popular is our lunch lecture webinar series. Those of you attending today represent many business sectors such as pharmaceuticals, technology, hospitality, and CPG, as well as MSI members like Walmart, Nike, Hart Hanks, Dow, DuPont, and more. We're delighted to welcome you to learn more about navigating disruption in the retail space. Before we begin, I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have during the presentation. We'll gather the questions and have a brief Q&A following the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Barbara Kahn is the Patty and J. H. Baker Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She recently served two terms as director of the J. H. Baker Retailing Center. Prior to joining Wharton in 2011, Barbara served as the Dean and Shine Professor of Marketing at the School of Business Administration at University of Miami. Before becoming Dean at UM, she spent 17 years at Wharton as the Dorothy Sibelberg Professor of Marketing. She was also Dean of the Wharton Undergraduate Program. Barbara is an internationally recognized scholar on retailing variety seeking, brand loyalty, product assortment and design, and consumer and patient decision making. She has published more than 75 articles in leading academic journals, and she co-authored The Grocery Revolution, The New Focus on the Consumer, and authored Global Brand Power, Leveraging Branding for Long-Term Growth, and The Shopping Revolution, How Successful Retailers Win Customers in an Era of Endless Disruption, both published by Wharton Digital Press. Barbara has been elected president of the Association for Consumer Research, elected president of Journal of Consumer Research Policy Board, and selected as a Marketing Science Institute trustee. She is or has been an associate editor at Journal of Consumer Research, Journal of Consumer Psychology, Journal of Marketing, and Marketing Science. She is a fellow for both the Association of Consumer Research and the Society of Consumer Psychology. Barbara received her PhD, MBA, and M philosophy from Columbia University and a BA from University of Rochester. So Barbara, thank you so much for agreeing to present with us. Uh, we're really excited to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it's a delight to be here, and thank you all for signing on. And today what I want to talk about is this new book that I just recently published called The Shopping Revolution. And it's really about this change in the retail scene and to try to put some shape on it so that we can understand what's happening. So if we look at uh, what's happening in, in retail, people are calling it a retail apocalypse. In 2017, more than 8,000 stores shuttered. That was the worst year on record. And that was on top of 2016, where even more stores shuttered. Um, at that time, and that was the worst year on record before 2017 happened. And now we're in 2018, and still more stores are closing. These numbers in 2017 doesn't include Toys R Us and all these other stores that have shuttered. So the question is, what's happening? What, what's happening to retail? Now let me just note, these are all the store closings. There are, and there are way more store closings than new stores opening, but there are some stores opening also. And it's kind of interesting to see who are the winners and who are the losers. So if we look at um, the screen here, I show you some very traditional retailers. And, all, and now Gillette's not a retailer, it's a CPG, consumer packaged good, but they're showing some uh, lowered sales also. And the question is, what is what is closing these stores or reducing these sales? What, what can we learn by who's closing and who's opening? So if we start with Macy's, we know that Macy's closed a lot of stores in some suboptimal malls called the B&C malls. Um, and the question is, who is getting those customers? So on one end, what we know is Macy's has a very big cosmetics and beauty space, and you know that's very important to the department store because it, it's given prime real estate. But they're losing a lot of those customers to Sephora, 
Ultra, and they're also losing customers to off-price retailers on one hand. And so you kind of think, okay, Macy's is closing, but these others are growing. What's different about what they're doing? And Macy's is also losing customers, of course, to online shopping, predominantly Amazon. If you look at Gillette, that's been a really big brand for a very long time, still a very powerful brand, but they've been losing sales. And who are they losing to? They're losing to little new, brand new startups like Dollar Shave Club or Harry's. These are companies that have started very recently by very young entrepreneurs, and they are taking sales away from a very strong brand that has been a leader for a very long time. So what is new about the way these retailers are operating compared to what's been done um, in the past? And if we look at Gap, we know Gap's been closing a lot of stores, and where has Gap lost its, uh, lost its customers? Well, one of them is to Zara, um, these fast fashion models, who have a very different model of doing business than Gap did. And Gap is also losing to some of these off-price, where people are now buying some clothes at Walmart or TJ Maxx or at Target. So if you look at these, you can see some of this traditional retailing. They're closing. They're losing share. And you look at what's characteristic about the other retailers who are doing very well, and their numbers are good. So that's kind of what was my goal in writing this book, to try to understand what is a winning strategy and what is a strategy that suggests things are not going well. Before I start with my framework, which I, I do want to talk about, let me just talk about some general trends that I've noticed in doing my research um, in this space, and then we can put all of this together and try to come up with a framework. So one trend, as everybody knows, is people are relying on their phones way more, and they're doing a lot more shopping on their phones. They're also shopping online, um, and this is a very big trend. And what's happening now is the successful retailers understand that retailing is defined as an omni-channel experience. Any retailer who doesn't understand the importance of online shopping or mobile commerce and doesn't have an integrated system between their physical stores and their online business is going to be in trouble. So that's the first thing. Retailing has now been redefined as omni-channel across physical and online channels, and it has to be a seamless integrated experience. The other thing about this is all of this creates big data. And people are talking about this in lots of different realms, but it's definitely relevant in retailing also. So if you have all your retailing outlets connected, you can produce this big data. The retailers who do not collect this data, they're in trouble because the ones who are winning do have this data, and they're in trouble for several reasons. One, if they don't have all their systems integrated, then they don't have the complete picture of each of their customers. Secondly, if your customers only interact with you once or twice a year, you don't have big data. Some of the ones that are really succeeding, uh, the retailers like, for example, Amazon, they interact with their customers several times a day, and that's creating big data. So the first thing to understand about this is if you want to use this data to personalize and customize the customer experience, you have to make sure that you interact with your customers frequently. And that's the first problem. Cust retailers who don't have that interaction, the successful ones are either upping the interaction with their customers, figuring out different ways to get information from the customer, or else they're partnering with other people on a particular platform so that they can get together with sometimes competitors, sometimes collaborators, to get more data about their customers. So that's the first thing. You need to have the data about your customers. The second thing that retailers um, who are not doing as well are, uh, the second problem with them is if they don't have the resources to get the customer analytics. So it's expensive to get the kind of people, the specialists, who can analyze this data and turn it into information. So bottom line, you have to have all your systems integrated. You have to have a lot of data. Um, and then you have to use that data to turn it into information. The other trend that's happening is um, – that we have a new brand of consumers. People call it the Generation Z. Now, regardless of what you think about generation cohort data and all that kinds of things, we do know that there are some systematic, fundamental differences in these new consumers. The first thing that we know that's different about them is that they are digital natives. They are used to using their phone, and they're used to shopping on the phone. And that just reemphasizes re the importance of this mobile commerce and having a good mobile platform. The second thing we know about Generation Z is 
that they rely a lot on consumer reviews to shop. Um, and that suggests the marketing is going to be really different, whether it's social media or making sure you're monitoring the reviews. But a lot of the information about different retailers come now from peer-to-peer, -peer, from consumer to consumer, and not necessarily the way they used to from big brand advertising coming down from mass, mass channels, mass media channels. And the other thing about Generation Z that we know is that they are interested in brands, but not necessarily the same brands as their parents had. So we see a real shifting in the marketplace to some new brands that are doing very well. And, and as I showed you before, some of these new brands are disrupting some of the old traditional brands. Another big trend, um, and this is was going to happen regardless, is the U.S. is overstored. We had too many retail outlets. So even if all these other trends weren't in existence, we still would have seen stores closed because we just have too many stores and a lot of suboptimal stores. Um, the U.S. is more stored than any other country in the world. Second is probably the U.K. And so you kind of see the situation wherever we have too many stores. Stores. Another trend is this notion of vertical brands. What, oops, before we get to Amazon, let me go back to vertical brands. What vertical brands mean is that the retailer can go directly to the end user, um, and that's vertical. So you're, this is, you're getting rid of uh, levels or in between. And what that means is a, a retailer who can go directly to the end user or a new brand that starts that can go directly to their end user they can um, eliminate some of the costs that involves in margins in each one of those channel um, uh, levels in between, and they can also move much faster. And I'll show you that this notion of vertical brands is part of what's happening in the retail disruption. And of course, the biggest change is what people are calling the Amazon effect. Amazon has completely disrupted the retail environment. And a lot of what my book is about is to try to really go through and figure out what is it about Amazon that really disrupted the environment. Okay, so what I tried to do with my framework is to come up with a, a strategic way of analyzing this whole retail um, environment. And my idea here is to be able to plot winners and losers on this framework so that we get some insight into what it's going to take to compete in this new world. And I base my framework on two very basic principles of marketing. Everybody who's in marketing knows these principles. But what's very interesting to me is when I looked at traditional matrices or traditional frameworks of retail, these very relevant marketing principles were not there. And that's very astonishing. Um, so the first principle is the principle of customer value, that you want to give customers what they want. And in retail, customers want to buy something they value from someone they trust. It's really very, very simple. So that's the retail proposition. Give customers something that they want. The second principle my matrix is based on is that if there's a lot of competition, and certainly this is a very competitive industry, customers are going to be drawn to the retailers who give them superior value. So that's the superior competitive advantage. These two very simple principles are what forms the basis of my matrix. And the matrix, at building on these two principles, is a new way of looking at retail. So let's go to the matrix. I call it the con retailing success matrix. And the idea, again, is what does it take to succeed in this new retailing world? So the first principle, the principle of customer value, says you have to give customers what they want. And what I would argue is that in retailing translates into giving them product benefits or a positive customer experience. And you'll see when I outline some more detail about this matrix, what's really new about this matrix is the customer experience column. That's what didn't exist before. The product benefits always existed, but the customer experience is what's new. The second principle is do it better than the competition. And the way you can do it better than the competition is to either increase pleasure or take away pain. And if I put together these two simple ideas, I result, it results in a two-by-two two matrix, and each of these quadrants has a special meaning. So let me go through the quadrants and explain it to you. So if I want to increase pleasure through product benefits, what I argue, that is kind of a branded product superiority 
kind of strategy. And so you see it, uh, we're talking about large assortments, you're talking about design, you're talking about good technology, and most of that is branded. And so I have some examples of some retailers that are doing well even in this um, in this disrupted retail environment. So Louis Vuitton and a lot of the luxury, that those are luxury brands, those are still doing well. Warby Parker, I'll go over them a little in, in a minute. That's a digitally native vertical brand. It's a new startup with a very strong brand that is doing very well. Um, Nike is doing well, strong, strong brand. Zara is a, a, it's a branded retail kind of environment or Saks which is, offers branded products. So one way to win is still to develop good brand. Another way to win is to think about increasing pleasure through the customer experience. Now, when I, in this quadrant, I am talking about physical store customer experience. A lot of people are talking about customer experience. They understand this is important. But it's not just about you know, serving coffee and having people be happy in the experience. You really need to build it into your strategy and think about it very um, creatively. And some of the new winners in this space, um, the customer experience space, the positive increased pleasure, Sephora is doing very well, Ulta is doing very well, and you can see these stores are crowded. People love to be in the stores. It's a very positive physical experience. Or those of you, Italy, there are not that many in the States. If you're not in a big city, you might not know. But this is a huge concept. It's usually as big as an entire city block. And it has restaurants. It has specialty grocery. It has cooking stores. And it's a wonderful experience to, uh, uh, to really get into Italian specialty foods. Um, and it's a lot of fun to go to. So that's the top row of increasing pleasure. Now, to eliminate pain points, a big pain point has always been price, and a lot of the successful retailers that are winning in this space are ones that offer very low price. Each one of these that I've listed here have different models, so Costco has a different model than Walmart, than TJ Maxx, but they're all offering operational excellence, really low cost, real efficiencies, and they're able to offer the consumer a low price. And the last quadrant is eliminate the pain in the customer experience. And that is make it easy. Create a frictionless environment, and that's going to involve collecting a lot of data, understand your customer, and maximizing the experience so you make it as easy and as simple as possible. And that is what Amazon has done extremely well and has leveraged that advantage to be a real leader in retailing. So again, if you look at this overall con retailing success, matrix. The product benefits column has always been there. Retailers have always Good retailers have always been good merchants. People talk about uh, retailers who will succeed as someone who can offer the great merchandising. Um, Mickey Drexler, who was a great retailer who did J. Crew and before that was behind Gap and Old Navy when they were very successful, he's known as the merchant prince. And so a lot of retailers in the industry will talk about somebody who really has the eye for product. And the other thing that old retailing matrices have always con uh, talked about is logistics. You have to deliver the product efficiently. You have to have real strong operations, real strong supply chain management, inventory management, and then you can offer this low price. So this first column on product benefits, that's not new. That's existed in other retailing matrices. But the column on customer experience is new. And this is the idea of saying, okay, fine, it's not just about the product, it's about getting in the customer's skin and understand what makes life easy for them or makes life pleasurable for them. And it's these retailers in particular who have been doing new things. The other thing that I um, learned from doing my research here is exactly how to use this matrix strategically. If you think of these four quadrants and you think of the origin as the center and then you draw out axes uh, into each of these quadrants, you can plot people's position or retailer's positions on each one of these axes. The other thing you need to plot is what fair value is. What are customer expectations in each of these dimensions for the retailing vertical that you're in? Um, and I have these uh, fair value marks plotted symmetrically around the origin, but they don't have to be symmetric. They can be wherever the customer expectations are. And the first principle of my matrix is that in order to survive and not be part of the retail apocalypse, 
You need to be at fair value, at least at fair value, in each one of these quadrants, on each one of these axes. And you see the retailers that are closing down were not up to snuff, were not up to fair value in some of these matrices. So if you look at Toys R Us, the store, the physical experience was not pleasant. They did not, it was not easy. It was hard to get things that you wanted. Um, you had to wait online, and it was it sometimes, especially around the holiday season, it was a nightmare to go. Um, or Radio Shack, they weren't offering the right products, and their prices weren't as good as they should be. So the first thing you know, this is if you want to survive in a very tough competitive environment, you have to be at fair value on all four of these. But what I've also learned, and this is again what's very new about this, uh, about this matrix, about this framework, is that it's not enough to just survive. You have to be the best at something. And that, again, is old marketing strategy. Be good enough at, at everything and the best at something. But what I have found in this very competitive environment, you have to be the best at something and then leverage that leadership advantage to be the best at a second quadrant. So I call it the two quadrant winning strategies. Good enough on two of the quadrants and the best at the other two. And what I found is there's examples of winning strategies in, on any two quadrants. There's not one that's better than the other. All of them can win if you exercise well. So let me give you an example of what I mean by these two quadrant winning strategies. So if you look at what Amazon's doing, and I'm going to go over Amazon in more detail and show you using my framework, that I would argue that they've become the very best at simple, at frictionless, at making shopping very easy. And they've leveraged that advantage to also be the best at low price. So if you shop at Amazon, you know it's simple, it's easy to get what you want, and you're going to get a good price. Now, Walmart offers the same two strategies, same two quadrants, but they come at it from a different point of view. So Walmart has always been an operationally excellent retailer, really great system, really got their costs way down, and that they could always offer a very low price. In this very competitive industry um, now, just having a low price wasn't good enough for Walmart. So Walmart also has to leverage that low price position to be the best at frictionless. And that's why they bought Jet.com and why they're doing a lot of their new initiatives, and I'll talk about what they're doing, so that they can make the shopping experience not only low price, but leverage that low price position to also make shopping easy. Warby Parker, which is one of these digitally native vertical brands, or Zara, they offer amazingly great brand. They offer you product or either brand or product that you really want, but because they go direct, because they're vertical, they can offer it at a low price. So it's a great brand or a great product at a really good price. Um, then if you look at uh, TJ Maxx or Costco, they're offering very low price, but they also offer really fun in-store customer experiences. Both of them use this idea of a treasure hunt, although they define it very differently. But they make the in-store shopping experience very pleasant, something that people want to do. And that Costco and TJ Maxx have been showing really good numbers. Even though Costco, for example, competes a lot against Amazon, they have still been doing very well because they have a very good experiential in-store experience. Um, what we see with luxury is where the big brands um, used to be good enough, you know, buy a Louis Vuitton or an Hermes scarf or something like that, just having the brand was good enough. In this very competitive market, they need to offer a very positive customer experience as well. It's not enough to just have brand. They need to add the second, um, the second quadrant. And another big winner is Sephora. And I would argue Sephora has one of the world's best loyalty programs, very, very good loyalty program. They leverage all of that data to also build a fantastic in-store experience. So that's what I mean by the two-quadrant winning strategies. Okay, let's take example. What I do in my book, and I'll do as much of that as I can in this time, is I use the matrix to go over these different strategies in detail. I give a lot of case histories to show how the matrix can help you understand what some of these retailers have done to win. So let's start with Amazon. Amazon, obviously a big disruptor. Everybody knows Amazon. There's 100 million Amazon Prime members in the United States, so probably all of you are Amazon Prime. So you know Amazon. But let's think about Amazon strategically. Starting in 1995, so they've been around for, what, 20, 
three years, something like that. They started as an online bookstore. Now think about why did, they could have started in any category. Why did they start in books? And I would argue that they started in books because the book shopping experience could be 100% digitized. So you can digitize the entire shopping experience and you could digitize the product. And so now what Amazon could do online is to completely reproduce a bookstore experience, only instead of having to go into a physical bookstore, you could do it online. So they make that parity. The experience is exactly the same. And then they have an endless assortment, so they offer way more books than can be offered in a physical bookstore, and they do it at a 30% price discount. This is a very compelling proposition. So they're as good as the physical bookstores, but better because the assortment is larger and the price is cheaper. That attracts a lot of customers to their platform. They go into, what do they go into next? They go into music. Again, a, ca a category that can be completely digital digitized, and next thing you know, they're putting the physical uh, music stores out of business. When they went into their online bookstore, Borders goes out of business. They go into music and, and this kind of thing, and then a lot of the physical music stores go out of business. The third category that they go into after music is DVDs, Goodbye Blockbuster. And so now what they've done is to offer these digitized experiences online that have attracted a lot of customers to their platform, and they have a lot of people interested and willing to shop at Amazon. In 2000, they opened up Amazon Marketplace. Now, what, mar what a marketplace is, is they offer the platform to third-party sellers or to other retailers and typically small merchants so who want to come on their platform so that they can get access to this big customer base that Amazon's created. On Amazon Marketplace, they, they – charge them a commission and fees, but these other third parties are the ones who are responsible for their own inventory. And a lot of merchants are attracted to the Amazon marketplace, including ones like Toys R Us, who didn't realize how Amazon plays and ultimately went out of business later on. But it also attracts a lot of merchants, a lot of third-party sellers. And so by offering this Amazon marketplace and allowing essentially their competing retailers to to uh, compete on their own platform, um, Amazon can now offer not just digital products, but any product from A to Z. And so they now have all sorts of products, a, a huge product assortment available on their platform, and they're making money through commission and through fees. Now they have all these merchants and many, many small merchants who don't have sophistication on online shopping, so they start which was pure genius, Amazon Web Services. And what Amazon Web Services is, is infrastructure as a service, and they provide for all the merchants that are on their platform, any kind of internet um, facility that they need, you know, a payment system, a website, and they charge it as they charge a utility. So if you're a small merchant, you don't have to do a whole lot of upfront um, costs. You can just pay for what you can afford, and as you grow, you can purchase more and more web services from Amazon. This turns out to be very, very important for Amazon because Amazon makes something like, I don't know what the number is exactly right now, but at least something like 60% of their operating profit from AWS, from Amazon Web Service. They are making their money from AWS. They're not making their money particularly from the retail transactions. And so it also is a way for Amazon to fund their retail business so they can reduce the margins on each one of these retail transactions, and the money comes in from AWS. The other thing that happens with this, with Amazon Marketplace and AWS, is Amazon has all the data. They have all the data from all of their competitors that are selling on their platform. And they don't relinquish all the data. They let some of the retailers purchase some of the data, but not all of the data. They know more about their competitors than their competitors know about themselves because Amazon owns not only the marketplace de data, but the AWS data. And so they know everything about all the transactions that are occurring on their space. Let's go back to the matrix now and see how I can plot this on my matrix. 
So what I would argue is the way Amazon is winning is that they come in this frictionless category and they keep innovating. And what happens when you innovate like that is you keep raising customers' expectations. And Amazon is always ahead of the curve. The other implication of this matrix is you have to be good enough at all four of these quadrants. But if you have really creative retailers competing in this space, they're constantly ratcheting up what customers' expectations are to be good enough. And so it, what happens with Amazon is now everybody expects things to be delivered very quickly, or they expect everything to be simple. So to just keep up at fair value in this quadrant is difficult because Amazon is constantly raising the stakes. Just to give you a little idea of how creative and to understand what I think is the brilliance of Amazon, let me go over some of the um, examples of the innovations that they put forth in this frictionless quadrant. So the first thing they did, and I think this was in 1997 is they invented one-click shopping. Now, this was such a new idea at the time that they patented it. This was mind-boggling to me. They patented one-click shopping, and that patent only expired last year. Now, why was this such a new idea? And this, again, goes to the idea that um, people, retailers just did not prioritize customer experience. What Amazon understood with one-click sh shopping was that Customers want things to be as simple as possible. The thinking at the time that Amazon did this was to design web pages so that you could lock customers in and get them to go deeper and deeper into your web page. The thinking was if you can engage a customer with your web page and they spent more time with you, they'd be more likely to buy. Amazon turned this idea on, the head and said, on its head and said, no. Customers want things to be as easy as possible, and that's what one-click shopping was. And they owned that easy, easy shopping for 20 years. As I understand it, Barnes & Noble could figure out how to do one-click shopping. It wasn't that hard technically to figure it out. And Amazon sued them, and they had to add at least another click. So the first idea was make things easy. Don't, make things walk. Don't put the milk in the back and make people figure out how to get to the store. Don't have a maze in the store. Make it as easy easy as possible for them to shop. The second brilliant thing they did in this category was to come up with this idea of Amazon Prime. We already talked about, I think there's 100 million um, Amazon Prime people. This is their loyalty program. They make fees off Amazon Prime as well, so this is another revenue generator for them. Um, Amazon Prime shoppers spend more time on the site, and they buy more, and they're very, very loyal. We know with Amazon Prime Day, they attract a lot of new members to Amazon Prime. Here at Wharton, they gave all the MBAs free six months on Amazon Prime. I assume they do this at other universities as well. As well. I teach in the core, and at the end of the six months, I ask my students, how many of you are not going to renew Amazon Prime? And the answer was zero. Once you get into Amazon Prime and you see how easy it is to shop and what a good deal they give you, you create incredible loyalty. And then you lock in these customers and Jeff Bezos has been known to say that Amazon Prime is the flywheel for, for their whole program. You lock these people in. You generate the big data. They, now they can build all sorts of other things into the program with media and all these other things they're doing. They're interacting with their customers several times a day creating that big data and creating that loyalty. That's another aspect of this frictionless quadrant, another thing that was really new to retailers. Retailers always had this customer data, but for years and years and years, they just never leveraged it. It's shocking to me that they didn't. The other thing that they introduced last uh, Christmas, last holiday season, was this notion of Alexa, of the Amazon Echo. They essentially sold it under under costs, and they got a lot of people to adopt these Alexa. And peop a lot of uh, retailing experts are predicting that in the future, retailing is going to be voice recognition, voice, that's, you know, this idea of uh, online ordering through voice is going to eventually take off. I have seen some preliminary data on this, and so far it has not 
um, trans transferred into more shopping, but I still predict that once this gets smoothed out, this will be so convenient that it will become something that's important in another aspect, another innovation in the frictionless quadrant. So what they've done in this building up this loyal base, they then leverage their leadership position in um, frictionless to then offer low price. How can they offer the low price? There's a few things that they do. First of all, um, Wall Street has made it very easy for them to not have to show the same kinds of quarter-by-quarter -quarter successes that other traditional retailers have. So Amazon was able to lose money, and their stock price wasn't affected. So that was an advantage that Amazon had but with Wall Street for some reason, and the, those, um, those Wall Street analysts were not giving that same advantage to other retailers, which is part of the reason why I believe Nordstrom was trying to go private. The second thing is they don't make their money on retail transactions, so they can offer very, very slim margins. They make their money on AWS, on Amazon Marketplace, and on Amazon Prime, not on the retail transactions. The third thing is they have all the data from anything that's sold on their platform and all the data from AWS. So they can design algorithms that force anybody who's, so, who's selling on their platform to sell at a lower price, or you won't get a good positioning on the platform. So they use the data to force all sorts of re retailers or brands that are selling on their, pro on their uh, platform to offer at a lower price. We also know that 55% of product searches online start on Amazon, not on Google. And so if you're going to go shopping uh, for, uh, on, online, typically the first place you go is to Amazon search engine, not Google. If you do go to Google, though, um, and Amazon knows that this is a brand that's important, one of the first things you'll see if you search on Google is the Amazon link for that product. You'll click on that, and you'll be back in Amazon's environment. And when Amazon has all that data, they can be sure to leverage um, it so that they can force their retailers to sell at a lower price. And if they don't respond, Amazon Basics will produce a product at a lower price and compete with their partners on this platform. So they're constantly focusing on offering the lowest price to the customer. The other thing they do is they plow their money back into reducing costs. Again, because Wall Street doesn't force them to show a profit, they can take all their money and build up the infrastructure, build up the warehouses, build up what they need to do to keep their prices low. So these are the two um, quadrants that Amazon is the leader on. Now the other two quadrants, I would argue, they're just fair value. Let's look at what they do in brand. One of Jeff Bezos' supposed quotes, and it's one of his most famous quotes, is the quote, although I couldn't find a way where he actually said this, but many people attribute this quote to him, which is, your margin is my opportunity. What I would argue on my matrix, what that looks like, is they take fair value of brand, and what he's essentially arguing is that you're paying too much for brand, and therefore I want to lower your expectations down, and I will meet a, deliver a product easily and at a good price that meets that expectation. So that's how I would plot that here. You can imagine that if Amazon is constantly pressuring products to um, lower their price and they're trying to make a brand a commodity um, and get rid of brands, that you don't see a lot of luxury brands or those kinds of things wanting to sell on Amazon. So the big luxury brands or anybody who has a really strong, strong brand resists selling on Amazon. And what was very interesting was that at the end of 2017, one of the biggest brands in the world, Nike, agreed to sell on Amazon. And this was a very surprising phenomenon, and a lot of analysts looked into why this happened. Because for 20 years, Nike tried not to sell on Amazon because they understood the strategy that I am describing to you. So why did they come on? Well, the first thing is, remember I mentioned 55% of product searches start on Amazon. So if Nike is not on the platform where people are shopping, when people are shopping online, they've missed out on that. Second of all, all their competitors were on the platform. Adidas, Under Armour, they're all sold on Amazon. And therefore, if people are searching online, they're going to go to their competitors. Again, they're going to lose their sale. And perhaps the biggest reason Nike went on is although Nike did not sanction their own brands to sell on Amazon for 20 years, a lot of third-party sellers were selling Nike on Amazon. And so Nike was actually one of the biggest products bought on Amazon in their categories. 
but it wasn't authorized sales. And so Nike could not control the shopping experience and could not control the price. And so for these three reasons, they decide to go and sell on Amazon. And, um, but they're a very strong brand, and so they can negotiate a different deal than other brands can negotiate. And they negotiated a situation with Nike where they start to police counterfeits and they start to police some of these third-party sales so that Nike can control the shopping experience more, control and develop their brand. Meantime, Nike is trying to all sorts of new concepts in their physical store to try to keep people within the Nike ecosystem and not have them go to Amazon because uh, Nike would like to keep people within their own ecosystem. So there's, it's still a challenge, but that's why Nike went there. Now Amazon has also argued. Uh, also put out notice that they're going into healthcare, they're going into financial services, they're going into tourism. They're using the strategy to go into all sorts of different um, industries. And every time they make an announcement that they're going into something like that, you see stock prices fall because when Amazon decides to go into these areas, Amazon's going to do a really good job. So that's kind of what's happening in their branded quadrant. Then in the experiential, and this is physical store, I would argue that Amazon is not really prioritize this. They do not have the physical store experiences that many other more traditional retailers have. They recognize, though, that online shopping is not the be-all and end-all of shopping, and that it is important to have some physical stores. So they have done several things, as I'm sure many of you know. The first thing they've done is they've opened up their Amazon bookstores. Um, and Amazon bookstores are interesting stores. They're different than other kinds of physical stores. You go into it, it looks like a decent bookstore. You know, it doesn't have a huge selection. They only offer books that are um, four stars and above. Um, they, they, instead of stocking the books by the spines, they show you the cover of the book. Um, and so you can see more about the book. They have a little tag underneath it that has a, an excerpt from a customer review because we know people are shopping by customer reviews. So all of that's going on in the bookstore. But what's really interesting about it is there are no prices on the book. If you want to find out what the price of the book is, you have to log into your Amazon uh, Prime app, or else you have to go to a kiosk somewhere else in the store, and then you scan the book, um, and then you get the price on your phone. And so they can give differential prices to Amazon Prime or non-Amazon Prime people. If you're Amazon Prime, you'll get a decent discount. If you're not Amazon Prime, you'll pay list price for the book. Now what that's doing is forcing people to log into the app so they can integrate anything that happens in the physical store with online or mobile commerce. And as I said before, that's really key. They're teaching people to shop with the Amazon app. They've also opened up, they, I think they only have one right now, but they're talking about opening another one, the Amazon Go stores, which is a food store. And you know that's just go in and you don't have to wait online to, to, uh, to pay. So you, you go into the store. Again, you scan your Amazon app. So now we've integrated all the data. There are sensors all over the store that can watch anything that you do in the store, any behavior that you do, any product that you take. And again, we're going to get all the data. We know exactly what you've looked at, where you've walked in the store, everything like that. We can integrate all that data with all the rest of the data that Amazon has. And then when you're done shopping, you just walk out. And you don't have to pay, stand on any line to pay, and it's very, very easy. So with these Amazon stores, they've made shopping in the physical store just as easy and frictionless as they have online. And they figured out a way to make sure they can integrate all of the data. So just think about the amount of data that Amazon has. It's going to have the data in the physical store. It has the data on their platform, not just from what they sell, but from what all their competitors sell. It has AWS data. It's now starting to get into the media business, so it has all of that data. This really is the definition of big data. And then, of course, most recently, uh, Amazon purchased Whole Foods, and so they now have physical stores that are closer to their neighborhoods so they can have a physical place that people can go in and purchase. Um, and this is what I would argue is Amazon's strategy and how it maps onto this framework. And if you look at what's called Amazon's virtuous cycle, um, and if you, if you uh, search for this, you'll see it's all over the Internet. And again, I don't have proof of this, but everybody on the Internet seems to believe that Jeff Bezos drew this picture on a napkin. And if you look at in 1995 or 1997, which suggests that he has had this strategy 
forever. And if you look at it, you'll see it's exactly what I, what I described. Growth is going to come from giving customers a great customer experience. And what he meant by that is make it frictionless, make it easy, collect the data so you can constantly personalize and customize. If you do a great customer experience, that will drive traffic to your site. The traffic to this site will attract sellers. That's with Amazon Marketplace. And then you will have a broad selection. And then you can leverage on that advantage to lower your cost structure and lower prices, and that is the Amazon advantage. It's those two quadrants, frictionless and low price. I use the, uh, oh, one other thing Amazon's going into now. They're talking about going into new home security uh, services, so they're getting into the home. I don't have time to discuss the implications of that, but if you think about it, you'll see yet another way that Amazon's going to compete successfully. I use the matrix in the rest of my book to talk about some of the other retailers who are doing well, and I try to map that on the matrix. So just very quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, Walmart competes with operational excellence, an amazing strategy. They were the leader for years and years and years in this operational excellence, low-cost efficiency, low-price strategy. They are now building on their stores and the fact that they're the largest employer, a private employer in the country, to leverage those store and sales associate advantages to offer a frictionless. They're below Amazon for sure on frictionless, but they're trying to get up to speed, but they're doing it a different way. They buy Jet.com so they can have a, a much better online um, presence. And Mark Laurie, who was the uh, a person who started Jet.com, is now president of Walmart.com, and he's doing a lot of strategies there. They're doing a lot of things to make shopping easier by um, merging a much more better omni-channel with online shopping, pick up in the store, um, all sorts of new programs to make shopping as easy as possible. They also are buying a lot of startups like Bonobos is one of them. Andy Dunn, who started Bonobos, is in charge of some of this product benefit. So they're trying to improve their product assortment. They're trying to offer more upscale things. They just offered a new service in New York called Jet Black which is a luxury service. Most of these product um, strategies where they're trying to improve the product assortment and uh, improve the brand position in Walmart is being done off the Jet. Um, they have not merged those two platforms, so Jet is separate from Walmart right now, and they're doing a lot of things to increase their position in the product benefits. They're still not really maximizing the in-store physical experience, so they're you know, below fair value there. But I would argue what Walmart is doing is, try, is leveraging their leadership position in low price and then trying to be a leader in frictionless also in, in, on that quadrant and then be good enough, fair value on the other two. Um, if you look at other things, what I would argue Costco and TJ Maxx is doing is that they offer the very high, with very good efficiencies, they can offer a low price. But what they do is they try to bend, make the store experience great. And so I don't have time to go through all the strategies there, but these um, Treasure Hunt, TJ Maxx, Burlington Ross, people love to shop in the store. They love the idea of if they can find something special. Um, and so, or Costco builds a lot of great in-store customer experience by, um, again, a treasure hunt strategy is a slightly different one, but also you can buy gas there, and so you have to drive to the store to get the gas. They have in-store sampling, all sorts of things that make shopping very pleasant. And what we know is that people seem, 60% of Costco members are also Amazon Prime members, which suggests that Costco is offering something over and above Amazon Prime. People are willing to have two memberships, and it's because they're in store experience is so great. They're not fair value on brand because you can't get any product you want at, at Costco or at TJ Maxx. And they're behind the curve on this online shopping, although Costco is trying to catch up. Um, luxury is another strategy where they, um, the paradox of love luxury is that they can offer a low price. They can't make it too easy because that takes away the luxurious experience. So what luxury has always done is offer a scarce, high price, wonderful product at the brand level. But now because of the competition in the market, they also are doing some very interesting things in, in the customer experience quadrant as well. Um, digitally native vertical brands, these are the ones I was talking about, like Warby Parker, Bonobos, Casper, they're all digitally native. They start online and they go direct. They offer a very good brand position, and they, because they're eliminating layers in the channel, they can offer a good price. Because they started online, they have tons of data, so they're actually very good in the frictionless 
um, behave, uh, department, and they also can op- when they start opening stores, and many of these have, they have a different way because they have so much data to make the in-store experience great. So if you look at these DNVBs, you'll see they're above fair value in all four quadrants. That is very hard to do in a competitive market. But the reason they can do it is because they're small. And not all of these digitally native vertical brands are going to make it, um, but they all have very similar strategies. They're disruptors. And I would also argue Zara is, a, is in this space. So it didn't start out as a digitally native, but it went direct right from the beginning and used some of those insights. I don't have time to talk about those here, but they're detailed more in my book. Um, so just an example of who are these digitally native vertical brands. Um, you can see on this list um, a whole bunch of different ones that are trying. They won't all make it. Some of them you may have heard of, Away, Everlane, um, Honest Company, Harry's I already mentioned, and you, Casper's on there. These are all things that are, that are um, going after strategy the way I just described it. Um, so um, in conclusion, I know I went through a lot of this stuff. If you're interested in more of it, you can take a look at my book. But the idea here is to put together a framework so that you can make sense of what's going on in retail and think more strategically. And how do you decide what should be your two-quadrant strategy? Well, you, understand, you have to understand that when you pick a strategy, that's also going to attract different customers. So customers are attracted to different retailers depending on the customer's own needs. Um, and what you should do is figure out a leadership quadrant which is based on your strengths, based on what you can do better than the competition, and make sure that you're offering something that's of value to a customer segment and that there's enough money in that segment that you can be, that you can be profitable eventually. So you figure out what your first leadership quadrant is going to be. And then in this very competitive retail world, it's not enough to just be great at this one quadrant. You have to be great at a second quadrant, and you have to stay in the game to be good enough at the other two quadrants that are not your leadership quadrants, but remembering that people are ratcheting up expectations in those other two quadrants, so you're going to have to keep running after fair value while you're leveraging your strength in your leadership strategies. The only way this doesn't work is if you're in a little niche, like Dollar General is doing very well, Aldi is doing very well. They have one strategy, which is low price, but they're going after niche markets. Similarly, with those digitally native vertical brands, right now they're small and they're going after niche so that these these strategic implications don't necessarily fit what they're doing. But when you become a big player, you can't really be a leader at more than two, so you have to be a leader at two and then you follow fair value on the other two. Um, And as I said, remembering even when you're following fair value, the customer expectations are constantly being ratcheted up. So just being fair value means you're constantly growing in those quadrants as well. And that is all outlined in my new book, The Shopping Revolution. If you're interested in getting it, it is sold on Amazon, (laughs) of course, and um, or you can get it from Wharton Digital Press. And now I think we have a few minutes to take some questions. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, Yes, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions for Barbara, send them directly through the chat with presenter function on the left-hand corner of your screen, and we'll ask them for her. Um, So the first question I want to ask you is, so you mentioned um, it's really important to have data on your customers. What are some innovative ways you can increase customer touch points and get their data? Yeah, so like as you know, everybody sees what Amazon's doing. They have incredible creativity in getting tons of data. But if you're not Amazon, how can you do it? Well, what we're, because sometimes some of these retailers, you only interact with your customer a couple times a year. That's not enough data. So what we're seeing is that people are forming partnerships. They're forming collaborations. Um, a lot of some of these small, you see things like some of the small brands, for example, are partnering with Target or Walmart to try to get more data from them that way. That's a win-win. Target gets a cool new brand in their stores, and the brand gets more information about customers. So you're seeing that kind of thing, that kind of partnership. If you can build strong loyalty programs, you can get more data that way. You also have to you know, figure out the way Amazon did, ways to get customers to log into the app when they go into physical stores so you can collect that data too. That's difficult to do, and that's why it's very impressive what Amazon's been doing to try to get people to log into their Amazon app. But yes, that's, that is a challenge. Um, and the expectation here is that re- successful retailers need to know what customers want if you're going to build a successful customer experience, and that does require getting the data. 
Great. By Thanks the way, so much. Those are great suggestions. One other thing that um, I want to mention, uh, well, Zara gets data from their customers too when they don't do it online. They have at the end of each store, every day in the store, all the sales associates record what they've observed about their customers and they send it back to headquarters. So when people come into Zara, the fashionistas come into Zara and they request something, like the famous story is somebody requested a red scarf. Zara didn't have a red scarf. It was requested all around the world at several stores. So once they realized there was demand for the red scarf, they built the they made a red scarf and it was a big seller. So you can also get information by having systems to allow your sales associate to record what they observe as customers come into the store. Don't lose that data even if they don't make a purchase. Those are really great suggestions for our members. We had a bit of a, a follow-up question. Would something like traditional online survey data still be within the ballpark of um, a good way to get customer data uh, and their attitudes and opinions? Oh, sure. Of course there's always information in survey data subject to the same caveats. You know, people say they'll do one thing and they don't necessarily do it. But there is a lot of information, as there always is in traditional market research techniques. But whether or not people will fill out the um, – you have, you know, survey bias. You have that people don't necessarily say what they're going to do. So subject to all the caveats – uh, of some of the weaknesses of surveys, there's definitely information there. Any kind of information you can get is useful. Great. Um, so another quadrant that's pretty challenging for most retailers is the frictionless quadrant. So we're wondering how can retailers keep up with raising expectations in that quadrant? What um, kind of techniques would be useful for that? Well, you know, that's the Amazon effect. That There's no way else around that, but Amazon is a formidable enemy to many, many traditional retailers because they can sell product more easily online. And so you, have to, you do have to take the friction out of your shopping experience. And the, the funny thing or the ironic thing is some of these retailers that are struggling, they cut costs on sales associates and they make the shopping experience more horrific. And that just doesn't work well. I understand the need to cut costs when, it, when it's a challenging environment, but what customers are now demanding is you have a simple experience. Um, and you really need, if you want to bring people into the store, it's got to be worthwhile for them to buy in the store or else they're going to buy online. So you have to, the thing that's really different about what I'm suggesting in this matrix is this was just not something that retailers traditionally thought about. It's a mind shift. You have to think differently about the customer. Because in the past, retailers thought, if I create the product, customers will come and buy. And now you have to think, that's not enough. I've got to make it easy for them to come. I've got to deliver it to them. I've got to make it so that it's not a trouble for them because it's got to fit into their life, not into my life. It's, it's a very different way of thinking about retail. Great. And we have another question from Arvind. Um, which quadrant do you think specialty stores like electronic stores or furniture stores, uh, what quadrant would they specialize in or represent? Well, you know, can, there can be different strategies. There could be a low price if they're offering a lower price. It could be really wonderful product. It could be a brand strategy. Um, the furniture market is difficult because it's hard to deliver these really big products. But on the other hand, if you can get delivery easily, you know, people may be more willing to buy. So and, like I said, in any one of these industries, any one of the strategies can work. I looked over and I found a combination of all sorts of strategies, two quadrants, any diagonal, horizontal, vertical, anything could work. Um, so it, it isn't that one strategy is better than the other. You just have to make sure that there's a sizable enough segment that's interested in that value so that you can be profitable. Um, customer elect, uh, consumer electronics are being bought more and more online because customers see the product as somewhat of a commodity, and then they just want it delivered easily, and they're looking for price and simplicity. If you can come up with an innovation or a branded product that's really compelling, you can win on that. But if your product is essentially a commodity, then simple and low price is what's going to win. Thank you so much, Barbara, for your presentation, and thank you all of us. Thank you all of you for joining us. Um, so we'll be sending slides of the webinar to members soon, and if you have additional questions, you can reach out to Barbara at kahn at wharton.upenn.edu. And if you'd like to receive some related content authored by um, MSI's leading academics, you can please provide your email here. 
Um, and since 1961, nonprofit MSI has brought together the best minds in marketing from major corporations and top business schools around the world to improve business practice by applying science to marketing biggest challenges. Uh, thank you so much for joining, and we hope you tune in again soon.